Well, a very, very uh, warm welcome to you all on this bank holiday weekend. Uh, my name is Seb Crutch. I'm one of the psychologists here at Rare Dementia Support and the Dementia Research Centre at UCL. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to this April uh, sunny for now uh, uh, PCA webinar. Uh, I believe there are 90 of you registered. That's 90 different computers. You may be up as many as 150 of us as part of this conversation. Um, as we've continually said and continually meant throughout this strange period, we're sorry not to be with you in person, um, but really grateful for the work of people like Alicia Willoughby, uh, Nikki Zimmerman, Claire Waddington, and many others of the team at Rare Dementia Support for bringing us all together today to talk about uh, some of these uh, issues to do with PCA, what it is, what it's like to live with it, um, and how we can all um, work together to try and support you the best way we can. Um, so I'll tell you uh, a little bit about the agenda later on, but I thought what I'd start with, if it's okay with you, is a brief overview of what we mean by PCA. We're obviously uh, very conscious that some of you will be joining us for the first time or will have received news of a diagnosis of PCA relatively recently. And back in those wonderful normal times when we were actually allowed to meet in three dimensions and, and talk as human beings, then we often used to invite people who'd had a recent diagnosis to come a little bit early to join us for a coffee, for an informal chat with half a dozen other people in a similar situation, just to talk through what is this condition um, so that we don't assume too much for people for whom this is, is very new. So I'm aware many of you have been with us for many years, so I hope you'll indulge me just with a quick overview um, of some of the basic facts about PCA before we move on to the rest of the meeting. So as many of you will know, PCA or posterior cortical atrophy is, is a, a term, a phrase um, thought up um, in LA, in the States, uh, Los Angeles, by a, a, a neurologist called Frank Benson in the late eighties, who had noticed he was seeing an increasing number of people in his uh, clinics who had this particular combination of progressive visual difficulties with relatively spared memory and insight, and often people who were very young, so people often before the age of 65 years. So really not the typical so-called dementia picture that most of the public have in their minds. It became very apparent that these were issues of brain sight, not eyesight. So this is to do with not a problem with the eye perceiving the world around, but how the brain is interpreting that information, parts of the brain, particularly at the back, uh, which receive all of that rich input about colour and shape and movement from the eyes. And the sorts of difficulties that most people with PCA um, describe broadly include difficulties with seeing where things are and difficulties with seeing where things are, although I'll mention a number of other non-visual problems in a moment. So if you're reeling, if you've had this diagnosis recently, then if you were turning up to this meeting in person, I think you would be meeting other people who were telling you about their difficulties with things like reading. So perhaps getting lost on the page or the words seeming to move around. Lots of people sharing tales and stories about uh, various uh, exciting escapades in relation to driving be that weaving around across the lanes, clipping wing mirrors, having difficulty parking, those sorts of really complex spatial difficulties uh, with seeing exactly where things are or sensing where things are that many of us um, rather, rather rudely um, when we get to talk to you realise that we take for granted skills we take for granted. Lots of people also describe spatial or seeing where problems in terms of missing things that are right under their nose, so perhaps missing food on a plate or being asked to pass something by someone else and actually just not being able to see that it's very easily within grasp because it, it just doesn't see or when you try and look at it it seems to disappear. And also lots of people talking about difficulties for example confusing left and right, um, stories of people for example walking with their partner towards a set of stairs and then suddenly realizing that they've gone down when their partner's gone up or someone who's um, previously had a very good sense of direction, um, getting funny de uh, directions or responding to verbal commands about where to go, um, very tricky. And also people having difficulty judging distance, 
Um, so um, people who perceive things as being terribly close or threatening or st are startled by something that they thought was very close when it's actually far away or vice versa. And in terms of uh, seeing what things are, Again, the, the tales, the stories that we often share around the coffee table include things like difficulties seeing objects, faces, recognizing both familiar and unfamiliar things, particularly when viewing conditions could be described as not ideal. So when it's a little bit dark or the lighting's not great, when there's a shadow or there's something half covering the thing that you're looking at, um, and also when um, people find that they are not quite able to perceive the size of something. There are lots of these visual experiences which seem to be very counterintuitive and indeed sometimes make you yourself or someone you're trying to describe this experience to kind of almost doubt yourself about is this, is this real or not. People who, for example, have, find it easier to see small words or writing than large writing or people who very commonly, as with all of these progressive conditions, you, you can sometimes see things, but other times you can't. So there seems to be a, a little bit of inconsistency, particularly in, in the early days, which is um, very distracting. And also things like um, things that are transparent, things that are glass. So, you know, seeing is a window open or closed, you have to actually sort of reach out and feel it or um, difficulty with shiny surfaces or whether reflections, anything that makes visual um, information interpretation for the brain more difficult. But of course, it's not just about vision. Lots of people come describing difficulties they've had with skills like spelling, uh, with writing, with calculating numbers, um, and also with doing skilled movements of the hand, using tools, like learning to use a new tool or or just manipulating uh, cutlery and those sorts of things. Um, so this is not just a visual problem. And um, in terms of why this is happening, why vision, why, why is vision affected? Fundamentally, it's because um, in PCA, there is some shrinkage of some of the brain tissue. Cheerfully, all of us, certainly of my age, are losing a little bit of brain tissue every year, but that process is accelerated um, particularly towards the back of the brain, these areas of the brain that are involved, as I said, in interpreting visual information and spatial information. And why is the brain shrinking? Well, we think in the majority of people with PCA, it's because of Alzheimer's disease as an underlying disease condition. So a set of proteins in places they shouldn't be causing cells to not talk to each other so well and eventually to, to die off, hence the brain shrinkage. Um, that's not the case for absolutely everybody. Um, and so lots of people find it useful to hold on to this term PCA as a description of their of their what they're experiencing, the syndrome, rather than the underlying um, disease. And that's an important distinction that Keir will um, pick up on a little bit more later on when he thinks about well, why are some of us getting this Alzheimer's disease early in life affecting the back of the brain. It's worth pointing out that no two people are the same. So again, imagining yourself back at that coffee table um, at a physical support group meeting, some of the people you'd be talking with would likely have experiences just like yours. Um, similar experiences in a similar order over a similar period, developing over a similar period of time. Other people are different. Some people will have much more difficulty with perhaps seeing where things are than seeing what things are, or would have particular for example, difficulty with the motor side of manipulating tools and would feel their vision was you know, not perfect, but, but not so bad. So it affects everybody differently. And, and indeed, there's a real range, particularly um, because it's so commonly caused by Alzheimer's disease. There's a range of people who have really, really pure visual problems and seemingly no, no difficulty with things like memory and other people who will be a little bit more half and half. And everyone's welcome in our group. And we don't make judgments. There's no sort of purist agenda to say only, only people with very, very pure PCA can come. It's a real range. And we just accept that some of the experiences, particularly that you'll hear relayed later on for the, by those living with the condition, some will chime with you and some may not. And that's, and that's fine. That's to be expected. We also try and talk openly in these groups about the fact that PCA is a progressive condition. Um, so we don't shy away from that. Um, but we want to, to be respectful of your wishes 
to learn as much or as little as soon or sooner or later about your condition as you want. And the group have been particularly involved in projects um, which have helped us to understand how the disease progresses, whether that's through brain scans that people have had multiple times over multiple years to help us see what's, what's happening as the cause is progressed, or describing the stages of PCA and particularly in a practical way um, to try and think, well, what, what was useful for different people at, at different times? So we can try and shape the advice that we give you based on your own experiences. And we also try and think about, as I say, some of the non-visual um, conditions. This is, we sometimes refer to this as the sort of visual dementia, but we're very conscious that for lots of people, it will affect not just vision, but things like hearing, um, your perception of your body sense, so your ability to, for example, to get dressed may be affected by not being exactly sure exactly where your limbs are or how to make certain movements. Um, and certainly things like language, particularly retrieving words, can become increasingly difficult. And over time, some people um, will have issues with mood and anxiety. And certainly we know that memory problems um, gradually, gradually emerge over time. But we try and stay positive um, and try and look at how we can understand um, the, the strengths that you have, many, many strengths that you have, um, and, and not just to focus on, on what's going wrong. And that really is where I want to leave you, which is just so much of what I've been describing, so much of what we, the so-called experts, know about this condition comes directly from you. We're not the kind of madcap white scientists who are with test tubes in a lab and suddenly, eureka, we suddenly make a discovery. Almost everything we know about PCA has come from the generous contributions that people like you have made. And that's not just people who are willing to sit in noisy scanners or have blood tests or undergo uh, neuropsychological testing. But every time you come to a group like this, every time you describe your experience, as Edward, for example, will do later on, or you ask a question in the Q&A, it reveals something of what you're, what you're coping with and it helps to shape the, the, the image in our minds of what it is to live with PCA how it evolves. And we've learned many things about PCA that we would not have known were it not for the conversation that happens in groups like this. So there's lots more um, to talk about, but time is short. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to hand on to my wonderful colleague, Keir Yong, who co-leads the PCA Research Program at the Dementia Research Centre. And he's gonna give you um, a few research updates. And then I'll be back a little bit later on um, to introduce you to some of the other um, pre-recorded talks that members have offered before we have a question and answer session at the end. So I'll leave you for now and hand you over to Dr. Keir Yong. Hi there, my name is Keir. I'm a neuropsychologist and Alzheimer's Society fellow, and I lead the UCL PCA longitudinal study with Sebastian Crotch. I'll be giving an update on PCA research, focusing almost entirely on papers published since the beginning of last year. While I've attempted to maximize the accessibility of slide presentation, I'll be saying aloud key messages throughout. Furthermore, I'll be sharing these slides and accompanying resources separately. The topics I'll be covering today are a review in the leading neurology journal on Alzheimer's disease and how it may affect different people in such different ways. With some people experiencing predominantly changes in vision and spatial awareness owing to posterior cortical atrophy. Some investigations to better understand changes of perceiving what or where things are experienced by people living with PCA, which in some instances may not relate to vision alone. I'll cover studies intending to infer brain activity in people with posterior cortical atrophy. Investigations of the genetics of Alzheimer's disease where the characteristic symptoms are not memory related and instead relate to perceptual, language or movement symptoms. And finally, I'll cover efforts to promote people with posterior cortical atrophy in receiving an accurate and timely diagnosis as well as appropriate support. Since the last PCA meeting, we published a review in the Lancet Neurology on atypical Alzheimer's disease. Atypical Alzheimer's disease refers to individuals who have the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's, so these so-called plaques and tangles, but whose initial and prominent symptoms do not characteristically relate to memory. 
Instead, their symptoms may relate to difficulties with vision and spatial awareness, such as in posterior cortical atrophy. Or in other individuals, these difficulties may relate to language, planning, behavior, and movement. This is a valuable opportunity to promote awareness, understanding and appropriate treatment regarding PCA, as this is the leading journal for clinical neurology. This involved myself and Jonathan Schott from UCL, working with international experts in brain imaging, markers of Alzheimer's disease pathology in body fluids and in the brain, with these experts coming from across the United States and the Netherlands. The review refers to posterior cortical atrophy as visual, spatial Alzheimer's disease, largely to promote interpretability to wider audiences. This review also features increasingly recognized atypical Alzheimer's presentations, which are more common for people in whom the onset of Alzheimer's disease occurs during their 50s or 60s. These presentations include language-led, or other forms of Alzheimer's disease, which involve early prominent multitasking or behavioral changes. And finally, some forms characterized by prominent movement changes, which may be misinterpreted as being Parkinson's disease. Beyond raising fundamental research questions regarding why Alzheimer's disease may affect different people in very different ways, the review makes recommendations for appropriate support and treatment for people with PCA and also recommends that people with PCA may be eligible to register as being partially cited, and this is consistent with separate proposals from neuro-ophthalmologists. In the next slide, I'll be focusing on changes in sense of space that cannot be accounted for by diminished visual functions alone, highlighted here under the visual spatial Alzheimer's disease term. Despite the frequent emphasis on visual aspects of PCA, this year saw increasingly documented non-visual perceptual changes. Using a variety of sounds played through headphones, a group of PCA participants were largely able to distinguish sounds presented one at a time. However, PCA participants had particularly difficult discriminating sounds when presented jointly. Task performance in control and PCA participants is represented here as dots with the PCA group on the right hand side. Here, lower scores indicate a greater difficulty with so called auditory scene perception. Findings are consistent with the phenomenon known as the cocktail party effect, involving having particular difficulty perceiving auditory objects, for example, my voice while I'm speaking over any background noise, and may extend well-documented effects of visual clutter on object perception in posterior cortical atrophy to the auditory domain. The last year saw separate work on functional imaging in PCA from Dutch and American centers. Functional imaging typically intends to index brain activity on a relatively large scale. So for example, across regions or across the whole brain. Historically, there's been limited investigations of patterns of brain activity in PCA participants. Electroencephalography, or EEG, is a technique to measure electrical activity of the brain via electrode channels. Whole brain activity was slower in PCA compared to control participants overall. Here's a bird's eye view of someone's head with measures of connectivity between these electro channels overlaid for control participants. Hotter colors suggest particularly interconnected channels, which in healthy controls seem to be particularly distributed towards the back of the brain. Here are the same measures presented for PCA participants. The authors interpreted connectivity measures as reflecting greater connectivity of frontal brain regions, highlighted here, in PCA participants compared to controls. These findings may somewhat overlap with a separate American investigation of functional magnetic resonance imaging in PCA. This technique infers changes in blood oxygen levels to indirectly measure brain activity. This American group found that despite lower overall whole brain connectivity measures in PCA compared to control participants, 
the authors reported increases in connectivity measures within certain frontal brain regions in PCA compared to controls. Tentatively, findings might be interpreted as compensatory shifts in activity. However, authors emphasize some caution in over-interpreting these connectivity measures, as well as in drawing comparisons between EEG and functional MRI findings. 2020 studies regarding genetic profiles in atypical language and movement-led Alzheimer's disease emphasize a recurring puzzle. The APOE genotype is considered the strongest Alzheimer's disease genetic risk factor, with the APOE E4 allele being associated not only with the increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, but also with the younger age of onset in typical memory-led Alzheimer's. However, despite people with atypical non-memory-led Alzheimer's disease tending to have a younger age of onset, if anything, they appear less likely to carry at least one of these APOE E4 alleles. This is also the case in posterior cortical atrophy. Essentially, there's evidence that the strongest Alzheimer's disease genetic risk factor appears to be weaker for PCA than compared to typical Alzheimer's disease. Furthermore, for all intents and purposes, PCA does not appear to run in families. Examples this year emphasizing diagnostic challenges included PCA participants who presented to neuro-ophthalmologists, noting diagnostic delays owing to a prolonged search of an ocular basis for any visual symptoms, and separate examples of PCA symptoms initially misinterpreted as being psychiatric. Ida Suarez-Gonzalez and the Rare Dementia Support Team emphasized particular challenges faced by people living with atypical Alzheimer's disease and rare dementias during the COVID-19 era. They reported examples of diminished mobility, increased reliance on hand roll use, and risk of exposure for people living with PCA. And myself and colleagues from UCL also published further work on environmental adaptations to promote more confident and efficient walking for people with a cortical atrophy. This followed common complaints from support group members in having difficulty negotiating surfaces with a lot of perceptual variation. Here's an example photo taken from my local pharmacy showing a lot of reflection, glare and hazard tape. Using movement sensor measures and working with medical statisticians from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, we provided evidence of increased walking efficiency and a re reduced tendency to hesitate during walking in PCA participants when limiting lighting variability and restricting stark shadows. This builds on previous work on environmental adaptations and assistive technology to promote independent activities such as navigation and reading for people living with PCA. The recent Lancet review includes both common scenarios regarding delay or misdiagnosis, as well as PCA specific considerations for care and support. Rare dementia support was mentioned specifically as a resource which offers both support and education for people living with PCA and their families. And on that note, I'd particularly like to thank support group members and research participants, many of whom have contributed to the development and or conduct of some of the studies mentioned today and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Keir. And I find it, as I hope you do, really encouraging that people like Keir and his colleagues, not just here in the UK, but internationally, are dedicating so much effort with your help to do really high quality science. Science that says PCA may be relatively rare, but it's a really important condition. And it's really important that we understand it and keep pushing to understand it better, not just for the people like you living with it every day, but also because it has so much to tell us about Alzheimer's disease and other degenerative conditions more broadly. And um, so thank you, Keir, for that really um, helpful and encouraging overview. Um, next, uh, it's my great pleasure um, to introduce a video um, with one of our members, Sandy, in discussion with Claire Waddington about her experiences of looking after her husband um, living with PCA. And I think this is a good reminder or perhaps a good point for me to mention that these support groups are a community and we are a community who we're permanently here. We're not gonna uh, 
um, discharge you or um, push you out the door at certain phases. We're a community who is here for people, whether you've lived with um, PCA for a few months or, a few, or many years. Um, and we understand and we really appreciate, we don't take it for granted, that for some of you, it will have been really difficult to decide whether to listen to this, whether to join the meeting today, um, perhaps thinking, gosh, what, who will I meet? Whose stories will I hear? Will I be asked to sort of think further into the future than I want to? We really respect the fact that everybody will hopefully take from this meeting um, what it is that's appropriate for them. And um, so we've got these next two videos from Sandy and then from um, Edward and talking about different perspectives and different aspects of living with PCA. So thank you ever so much, Sandy, for being part of this. Good morning, everyone. I am absolutely delighted to be here today with the wonderful Sandy, who cares for her husband, Neil, who has a diagnosis of PCA. So Sandy, thank you so much for joining me today. So Neil is now in residential care. Can you tell me a little bit about how it was for you and your children when he was still at home and about making the decision for him to move into a care home as well? Absolutely. Um, I guess, you know, initially when Neil was first diagnosed, um, it was relatively easy having him at home. You know, yes, we had some spatial awareness that we need to be aware of, but it it wasn't so bad. The children were only 10 and 13 when he received the diagnosis and they, they were great, you know, in accommodating and helping reach for things, etc. Obviously, um, as things progressed, it got a lot harder with him being at home. Um, so whereas before he was able to function pretty much normally, it was just the odd thing that he needed help with. It moved to needing help with pretty much everything. So um, washing, dressing, orientation, he had apraxia, he couldn't sit down on chairs, he couldn't focus on things on the table, um, couldn't manipulate a knife and fork. And I think, you know, we all became carers in many ways. In the year leading up to Neil going into the care home, he deteriorated considerably. Um, a lot of repetitious behavior happening, a lot of aggression coming out. Um, by this stage, my daughter was at university. Um, my son was still at home and kind of in, in school, in high school as such. And between us, we had to get in some care at home while I was at work. Because having such a young family, I needed to, you know, we still needed to carry on working. It wasn't an option for me to be at home. Um, and I think the decision to put Neil into a care home came down to lots of family conversations around how can we accommodate at home? Because Neil was having real problems going up and down stairs. Our house is really open plan. So there was no one room that we could create a dedicated bedroom for. Um, the downstairs bathroom shower to turn it into a full wet room with enough space uh, was gonna be a real problem. And I think more than anything, it was our difficulty in coping with Neil's aggressive behavior. He became very, very aggressive. Um, verbally abusive, physically aggressive. Um, yeah, you know, I would go to work quite often. I know my colleagues were concerned because I would have bruise marks on my shoulders. My son would, you know, take the blows from his dad. He would often have to pull Neil off of, off of me, et cetera. And I think, you know, it was, let's say it was a hard decision. It was an easy decision logically to make. But emotionally, I think for all of us, it was one of the hardest decisions that I think we'll ever make. And I think if I'm really being truthful, I still struggle with that decision today. I think it's easy to look back and think maybe if, if only kind of thing. But when I'm, when I'm calm and I'm rational, I know that we needed to make sure that Neil was safe, that he and he was being with people who could manage his uh, outburst better and not take it personally it's very very hard even though you know it's not really him not to feel the hurt of your husband you know being aggressive towards you which is something he would never do so yeah it was a tough tough decision but I think when I'm feeling calm and logical I know it was the right decision to make Thank you so much for, for talking through that, Sandy, and I'm so sorry that you and your family went through that. It sounds like an incredibly difficult situation. I completely agree that sometimes somebody's needs just can't be managed at home and the family really needs to be taken into account. 
in that mm. situation as well. So we know that caring for somebody with PCA who is in residential care has been really difficult um, for a lot of people during the pandemic. So I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about how this has impacted on you and how you work with the care home to, to support Neil as well. I think, like you say, it's been a really hard time for everybody. Um, and I think particularly with PCA, I would say in some ways it's almost been harder because the care home locked down earlier than the government did. So, um, you know, sort of before our kind of official date, about two and a half weeks before. So I was last able to visit Neil on the 29th of February as a regular visit. And then they literally closed down the next week. Um, they set in place um, a weekly video call kind of with, with Neil. The challenge with that is with Neil's spatial awareness, he I could see that he was like hearing my voice and, and, and almost looking around the room as if to say, well, I can hear you, but where are you? Um, so that was really difficult to get him to focus. He has, you know, become even over this past year so much less verbal. So his communication. So it's not even he can reply. So although we persisted with the weekly kind of calls, um, I noticed a couple of things. He was sleeping a lot more during the call. He might raise a smile when he heard my voice, but there was no real interaction. And I spent most of the time talking to the carers about how is he, what's going on, what's happening kind of thing. It wasn't really very satisfying. And more latterly, the, the home created a pod, a visiting pod, and would allow visiting behind the glass partition. And again, the challenge there, and I spoke with the home around this, around saying, would it be more distressing to Neil for me? You know, again, he can see me but not touch me, and touch is hugely important for him. You know, the whole time when I visit, he holds my hand and squeezes my hand, so and knows I'm there or goes to kiss me and things like that. And I, and we discussed how helpful would that be for Neil, and also how distressing would it be for me to be so close and not so far. So I chose not to take up the pod visiting options and continue with the um, FaceTiming kind of video calls, which at least kept me in touch with him and, and allowed me to see. Um, and it was only just over two weeks ago I was finally allowed to have a contact visit with him, which even thinking about it now fills me with emotion because it was just amazing. Um, I stood at the door when they brought him in and took my mask off so he could kind of semi-focused but the minute I held his hand his whole face lit up and he kind of started half laughing half crying I was in pieces but he knew I was there and at one point he squeezed my hand and just said you and I said yes it's me and he just said miss and I just thought there's something in his brain that he knows I've not been there um so it was really bittersweet in so many ways um on the time that we'd lost out together, how much he had deteriorated in that year um, with his mobility, with his speech uh, and everything else was really evident. But what was lovely last week when I visited, the carer said, Neil has been in such a terrific mood since your visit the last time, which kind of really convinces me about the power of the presence of people that they love in in their mental well-being you know however diminished it is it does make a difference so the home has been accommodating to a degree they've not been as helpful as i would have liked in terms of understanding neil's pca condition and almost lumping it all together as just alzheimer's or well he can see you well no he can't really see me he sees me in a distorted way so they were a little obtuse in terms of accommodating in that way, which which was really disappointing because I've been very, very happy with the care that Neil's received. And I really can't fault the carers. They are absolutely amazing. I think just some of the leadership, management rules and regulations have been frustrating for me. Absolutely. And Sandy, thank you so much for your description of how it was to see Neil again. I think that's going to touch a lot of hearts. And I agree that it is so important that the care home has that person-centred care. So it doesn't just lump people in as dementia, as, as Alzheimer's, but looks at the individual. 
So you are working full time alongside your caring role, which is a lot. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you, you balance the working and the caring as well? Um, as I said, Claire, you know, sort of that really when Neil was first diagnosed, it really wasn't an option. Although he got an ill health early retirement from, he worked at British Airways, which was a nice package. We, in terms of two young children, you know, hopefully going to university, which they have done now, you know, sort of, I knew that as much as I would have liked to have given up work and been a full-time carer, we couldn't have managed. We still had a mortgage, we had things to pay. And I would say that then balancing things, that caring role, was really hard because I think in many ways looking back now I can see that I sacrificed a lot of myself my my primary care was Neil and the children and just making sure that they were okay so when you say how did I balance it I don't think I did balance it I think you just cope I think you're just in the midst of it and you just have to get on as well as you can and obviously as Neil's condition progressed um, that became even harder. You know, I lived at work with my phone on all the time, would make apologies in meetings to say, if I get a call, I have to go kind of thing because incidences of him being aggressive towards the carers or we had a case where he, he wandered off and the carer didn't notice and you're forever on a high alert. And in a perverse way, work was my balance because I had to be focused on what I was doing. So it was almost a bit of a, switch off from the caring role because the minute I stepped through that door I was carer to Neil and of course mother and carer to my two children um, but at work I could be Sandy and just focus on on doing the job that I needed to do and enjoy some of the, the company. Since then I think as, as most carers who have a loved one in a care home my biggest struggle is always the guilt um, that that's what I have to balance the most and as I said whilst my rational mind will know that it's the right thing to do. My emotional mind or emotional heart feels like I've, I've let him down in some ways. Um, I've got better at taking care of myself. <laughs> I guess I've, I've got a bit more space to do that now that I know the day-to-day -day care is being taken care of. And I see my role primarily as being Neil's advocate to make sure he gets the best care he can. And secondly, to be uh, his emotional carer and make sure he's getting the love and affection that he needs more than the physical taking care of. Um, but I balance that with, I've got a great family. I have two amazing sisters who have been so supportive. The children are now older and amazing. Um, I have a good circle of friends. Um, I love to read. Um, and you know, I, I, um, I do needlework, I sew a bit, you know, I like arts and crafts. So. I think I get some time for myself in that way, but I do look back at the years that we had where I was the sole carer, albeit with support with the children and, and a paid carer to come in during the day while I was working and the kids weren't home, but you're always on. I think that's the thing, you are always on. You never stop in the middle of the night, you know, when he's up and wandering or he needs something or he's shouting out or you just don't realize till that stops or lessens just what a hamster wheel that you've been on for the whole time really. My challenge was in working full time I felt that I didn't deserve to have time away from the caring role that if I wasn't at work I should be caring for Neil whereas I know a lot of people who have given up their work to be full-time carers actually don't feel as bad carving out a couple of hours a week to go and do something for themselves. The most I used to do for myself was go to the hairdressers, you know, and get my hair done, you know. It, it, it's, it's a very strange thing when you're working to feel like you deserve that time off. If, well, for me personally, I can only speak for me. Absolutely, Sandy. Thank you so much for sharing that. Really, really lovely to hear about the support that you have as well. So you've mentioned your wonderful children. Um, and I wonder if you could kind of talk about whether there's any support that has been particularly helpful in, in regards to your children specifically? Um, as I said, I think, you know, that was such a big thing for me, the fact that they were losing their father, you know, in front of their eyes at a very tender age. As I said, um, my son was 10 and my daughter 13, and they've kind of grown with this condition. And I don't know if it's a male, female thing, you know, Alicia was so much better at 
pouring her emotions out, you know, being angry, which is quite right, and feeling cheated and talking about those things. And when, when Neil progressed and got worse, she did seek some counselling um, to help her understand, which was great. And I think it did help enormously. Um, Thomas has really struggled. The best support he got was actually me informing his school around what was going on. And I have to say the school were brilliant um, in just keeping an eye out for him. They had a very good pastoral care scheme. And one, one lady there, Mrs. Ilbury, who would just pull Thomas aside, bring him in for a hot chocolate and just get him talking about anything. He always felt that he could go and talk to her. In subsequent conversations with the kids, what, what was really evident for me is particularly from Thomas that he he never felt he could talk to me about it because he didn't want to upset me. He felt like I had enough on my plate without worrying about how he was dealing with it. And, and Alicia to the same extent. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's really hard because the support was there from me, from their aunts and, and things like that. Um, I guess my worry is still with Thomas that I think he hasn't processed a lot of these things. Um, he, he really did become, particularly at Neil's worst stage, one of the primary carers for him. I know Alicia cared for him enormously when she was around, but she was at university at this time. And so he had to deal with an awful lot. He always asks about his dad. He's only managed to visit him maybe once, twice since he's been in the care home. He finds it really difficult to deal with, but he doesn't want to talk about it. And now as a young adult, I have to kind of respect that's his choice. I've just made it clear that there is support out there for him should he want to take it. But I think, you know, I really would encourage anybody with young children to really make it a topic of conversation, if you can, as a family, to talk about how they're feeling uh, and everything. And I think part of, if I had my time again, I would do that more. I think I just wanted to make everything so normal for them that it was almost a subject that we didn't talk about. And I think we should have talked about it earlier. Thank you so much, Sandy. I think it's so important what you've said about kind of support as a, as a family unit. And also I think something that people often talk about is that protecting each other within the family, what you were saying, trying to normalise things. And I think it's, it's so important what you said about seeking professional help if people need and just making that safe space where, where children can share. And it sounds like you've done that. Really, really wonderfully. Um, so just one final question. Um, is there anything else that you feel would be really helpful for other people affected by PCA to know, just, just based on your experience? I think the best thing that you can do is really inform yourself about the condition and what's likely to come. And the reason that I say that is not just for your own knowledge. One thing that I have found myself doing is almost trying to educate people um, in what the condition is, because it's one of the rarer dimensions. Obviously, people don't know so much about it. Um, so trying to get them to understand how it presents itself, what this person needs, um, the fact that the chances are their memory is fine, or with Neil, with his communication, he, it started to go to the point whereby he couldn't remember the proper word for it, but he'd come up with an alternative word that was kind of a bit of a description for it. But being able to know how this uh, disease presents itself is not just helpful for you and the family, but anybody who's going to be caring for them. So I think I would really encourage people to be up to date with that. And I guess the other thing is, so it's easy to look back and say, I think I was so busy trying to cope that I stopped, I failed to cherish those moments. I was always in a what next mode rather than enjoying just, just having Neil here, having those moments as a family, even if they weren't the moments that we thought they were going to be, but just to really try to take stock of that. And, and something that I've been encouraged to do is, you know, um, kind of almost like a gratitude book at the end of the day, one thing that made you laugh, one thing that you're grateful for, because I think I would love to have that book now that I don't have Neil physically here with me. I think that's the, the scary part. You, you start to lose the person in the illness rather than appreciate the person who's actually there. So I think that would be my word of advice to anybody in this position. 
and I know it's cliched now that everybody's saying it, you know, but be kind to yourself. You know, this is rubbish. It is rubbish. It's, it's something none of us ever signed up for. So just give yourself some leeway, I think. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to get it right all the time. Um, and I think I tried too hard to be perfect and get it right. And I think I missed out a little bit, if I'm honest. Absolutely incredible, Sandy. Thank you so much for your incredibly powerful words, for being so open with sharing your experiences and for talking about your, your family and the support that you find helpful, as well as strategies that you found helpful. It's been incredibly, incredibly a huge privilege on my part to be able to speak to you. And I'm sure a lot of people watching will find it really, really important what you've said as well. Um, so thank you so much for, for speaking with me today. Thank you. Well, just a second, um, Claire's thanks uh, to Sandy there. A breathtakingly generous act um, of generosity to share so openly, so candidly, so clearly with such good humour, but such honesty as well about the heartrending decisions, the counterintuitive balances, um, to be able to talk about everything your remarkable family has been through, um, and yet to do it with such compassion for thinking about what will help other people, particularly navigating not only the peculiarities and needs of people living specifically with PCA and the particular challenges and support that was required, but also just those broader issues about living with a, a young, young onset dementia and um, all the implications for your wider family, your work, your sense of identity, everything else. Just fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things we're very keen in rare dementia support is also just to try and create spaces where people can have different decisions and uh, sorry people can have different conversations and uh, some of those conversations rightly happen together as as couples as families um, as groups but also we're very conscious of um, people's individual needs to speak about themselves uh, to say things that they might not want to say in front of their loved ones um, and so I just want to a, a brief reminder at this point before I introduce Edward um, that Rare Dementia Support, the direct support team that Nikki, Claire and others lead um, is always available to you to talk, um, but also we're always trying to create opportunities, small groups, large groups and other um, more informal settings for you to talk with others. One particular example which I'm um, pleased to announce is that uh, um, Roberta Mickey Jackson and Karen Tapson have just started up an online regular group for people with a diagnosis of PCA. Um, so typically for people in the early and middle stages of living with it themselves, in which um, in, in the friendliest and nicest way, um, partners are not allowed, they might provide a little bit of help to get onto the meeting, but where there are opportunities for to talk openly. And similarly, um, uh, we want very much family members to be able to talk openly and candidly too. So um, thank you ever so much um, again to Sandy. And now it's my pleasure to um, hand over to uh, Nikki to introduce Edward, who's going to talk about his own experiences living with PCA. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here with you this morning. And I'm very honoured to have one of our special members, Edward, with us here today. Good morning, Edward. Good morning. Now, Edward, could you tell everybody that's watching here today a little bit about yourself, please? A little bit about your background. Yeah. Um, so I was uh, diagnosed with posterior cortical atrophy in 2019 um, and I am trying to live as positively with that diagnosis um, as, as well as it's possible to do so. So um, I'm constantly um, doing things such as I, I do um, brain training, I do uh, an app called Lumosity, I do Headspace every day, um, and all those sorts of things. So I keep myself as active as I possibly can. And uh, also I go out for, um, I try to do 10,000 steps a day as well. So um, uh, that keeps me, um, keeps me fit and active and uh, keeps the weight, keeps the timber off. Brilliant. As you said, you were diagnosed in 2019 with PCA. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the process leading up to that diagnosis? Yeah, 
Um, I was I was very fortunate in that um, I I many um, because I have a private medical insurance. Um, I managed to get seen very quickly by a, a chap at, uh, at Warwick Hospital, and um, he was um, he was pretty sure of what the what the outcome was. That was subsequently confirmed by my consultant, who's a lady, a lovely lady called Sean Thompson, who we're seeing next month. And uh, she's she's been absolutely fantastic. And um, the, the one thing I did say was, I did say to her last time that we met, um, I said, well, do you know, I hate um, neurological tests. And uh, she's, uh, she's finally conceded that uh, we won't do them anymore because, you know, my, my diagnosis is my diagnosis. So there's no, there's no, there's no benefit in, in going over ground that we already are aware of. So. And she talks more about your well-being and what's happening in your life yes. rather than sort of giving you the test each time, which makes you happier. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely it does. And, and you know, as I said, she's a she's a lovely lady and I get on well with her. And we're 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 pals is a, is the wrong is the wrong term, but uh, but but we get on very well. So yeah. And as I say we're gonna see her next next month, I think. Yeah. I'm sure she'll be delighted to, to be known as one of your pals. I'm sure she will. Yeah, well, we see we, we see her face to face now, so um, so so she she she's all masked up and stuff, but um, but yeah, we, we see her face to face. So. Brilliant! It's, that's really great to hear. Great to hear you've got such a good relationship. But when you when you got the diagnosis, Edward, you were still working at the time, weren't you? I was. Yeah, yeah. I'm not not anymore, but yeah. No, no. But you were sort of quite happy still working and sort of did the diagnosis and the problems you're having that obviously led up to you finishing work yeah i mean yes they did and um uh, you know the work were work were good about it but i do suffer from uh, i do get quite anxious and um, get meetings like this um and uh, i um you know i do struggle um with just getting my words out, I suppose, really. Um, I, I don't have any major issues with, uh, with, with diction at the moment, currently. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, particularly with PCA, get sight issues and things like that. Fortunately, so far, I haven't had any of those um, and it's all been, it's all been okay. Um, but um, yeah, but that, that's good that you know you, you're aware of what the issues that you've got at the moment, and you tend to be able to adapt around that. Yeah. So, what about the impact that the diagnosis of had with your family and friends? Was it difficult to tell people about the diagnosis? Yeah, the the, the tough one was um, telling my telling my kids. I guess that was that was the hardest part of the of the whole lot, and uh, yeah, I was in, I was in pieces when I when I told them um, that was that was extremely difficult. Um, but you know they're they're, they're all okay with it now, and I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing my son and his girlfriend next week, um, and we're going up to London to see them and stuff like that. So you know it it. It was very difficult at the time, but we've but we've 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 got to work around it now, and um, we, we're we're getting on with it basically. And you find they're very supportive, sort of with with you and Samantha, sort of as a family. Yeah, that they are. That they they're they're, okay. they're 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 brilliant kids, um, all three of them, and uh, you know that they, and I get on well with them all, and. Um, so yeah, it, it's 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 a very positive experience um, at the moment. I mean, my, my son rang me yesterday and uh, to to talk to me and catch up and things like that, and you know, to the fat. So yeah, it, it's all good. Good, good, good. And did you have any issues sort of with any of your friends sort of like when you told them about the diagnosis? Was that a difficult time explaining to people? No, I don't think it. I didn't find it so. 
Uh, I, I was completely upfront and honest with them and told them that they've all been incredibly supportive. So, you know, for example, one of my loves is um, Oxford United Football Club. And um, I'm, we're, 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 we're going to arrange to go and uh, go to a match, um, all, all my mates and, and stuff. So, you know, things like that will continue to happen. Um, and, you know, as, for as long as I'm able to do so, I think that's, that's the thing. And the trouble is, I guess, is, is that nobody knows how long it's going to be before things deteriorate. And that's, that's the bit that frustrates me. Um, that's the bit I find very difficult to come to terms with. It is it is a it is a hard one to 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 bear really. And I think it's really important, isn't it, living for today? And when we've all had such a difficult year with the pandemic, absolutely. I mean, you must you must be absolutely dying to get back to the football. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, as I say, I've, I've been an Oxford United fan since I was eight, so um, it's um, it, you know it uh, and. Um, Martin um, is a is a is a Wickham fan. We're um, we're, we're deadly we're deadly rivals. So <laughs> so that's that'll be good when he gets back to meetings and stuff. That'll be good fun to have a bit of banter with him. Always important to have some banter, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So you you have adapted really well since um, finishing work. How do you sort of find you sort of spend your days now what sort of things have you sort of incorporated into your routines to help you i just keep doing things that i'm familiar with um that that I, I i've always enjoyed routine and and that gives me routine to to carry on doing things like that and you do you you exercise every day don't you as much as possible with your walking yeah, absolutely. Um, as I said, I, I try and get 10,000 steps in a day um, minimum and regularly achieve it. Uh, so I'm trying to keep as fit and able as I can. Uh, as I say, for, for as long as I can. That's, that's the thing that nobody can tell you. And I notice as well that you, you like your education, you like being on Twitter, you like being quite politically active as well as sportingly active as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Twitter is Twitter is 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 a, is a is a good medium. Although I have to say that recently I've sort of cooled down on it. Um, I'm, I'm not as vocal as I used to be, um, uh, but it's a good method of communication. Um, and I, I I so I mean one of the things that I I, I regularly listen to is dementia voices, um, and uh, and and listen to that on a, on a very regular basis it's um you know it's 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 nice to just listen to other people um who have a diagnosis so we've spoken before about anxiety and sort of things that you do to sort of combat this um edward and you know we, we know this has been a bit of an issue sometimes for you so do you want to share some of the strategies that you use to help with your uh, anxiety and to really focus on your well-being. Well, yeah, I, I, well, I mean, I, I, I do take um, a daily drug, uh, which is called citalopram, um, and that helps a great deal. Um, and uh, yeah, so it it, it keeps me. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it it helps a great deal in terms of in terms of the anxiety. And it's it, it, I, I find it useful to take, and it, it does calm me down, um, particularly particularly when I'm uh, um, feeling a, a little under pressure, as as, as I have currently. <laughs> um, what about some meditation? I know you do some apps, don't you? Yeah, well, I do. I do. Um, I, the, the one I do daily is Headspace, um, and, and I do that for fifteen minutes every day. And, um, and that works very well. And um, I've done it today and uh, I do it every day. And it's, um, it, it, yeah, I do find it, I do find it useful. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to relax and meditate and think about 
other things um, and, and takes you away from thinking about, you know, the diagnosis and all the rest of it. So, yeah, no, I, I do enjoy that. And um, just before we go today, are there any sort of tips and helpful, helpful bits of information you'd like to share with people that are watching today? I think I think the big one for me is staying positive. Um, and, you know, you've only got one crack at this life. And if you uh, disappear into depression and anxiety, uh, which I've, you know, I, I do suffer from, but I, I think staying positive is, is, is the biggest thing of all to, to, to just going and not give in to this, uh, whatever your diagnosis is and, and just keep going and stay positive. Yeah. Thank you, such wise words there. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us today, Edward. You're I'm sure welcome. everybody at this is very grateful. Edward will be on the question and answer panel later this morning. So please, if you have any questions or any comments you want to pass over to Edward, please send them in now. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. You're very welcome. Thanks ever so much um, to Nikki and Edward. Um, for that contribution just now. That was really, really um, inspiring and informative and helpful, I'm sure, for everyone watching. Um, I'm gonna welcome our panel back to the screen now. So if everyone on the panel could turn their, their cameras on, that would be great. Um, and we'll get started with the, the questions and answers. So I'm Emma Harding, I'm a research fellow um, at the Dementia Research Centre and helped out with the PCA support group for a number of years. So hopefully familiar to lots of you watching and yeah just really sorry not to be able to see you in person um, and yes welcome back to our panel I think most of whom we've met in in their videos but I wanted to say a special welcome to Professor John Schott um, who is a consultant neurologist um, and Professor of Neurology and Chief Medical Officer um, for Alzheimer's Research UK and again probably known to some of you who are watching um, and we'll, thanks John so we'll get started um, with the questions now and do feel free to keep um, sending those in. And I, I just wanted to thank our, our panel as well for such powerful stories that you shared there, Sandy and Edward, and um, some really interesting points of, of um, overlap in terms of that sort of staying present in the moment and really the importance of talking, you know, among yourselves, with your families, with professionals. Um, so really great that we're all here to do more of that today. Okay, so this first question um, is for you, I think, John. Um, so I'm just going to read it out. Uh, my wife has a diagnosis of PCA, and after a period of perhaps one or two weeks of feeling reasonably okay, she will experience a day of overwhelming fatigue where she struggles to think straight or do anything much. These often occur suddenly and do pass, but are a worry for her as she fears that they won't. I wondered whether there is any explanation for these events. So... Thank you, Erin. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so I think that the, the, the first thing to say, which is pretty self-evident, is that people with PCA are people. Uh, and all of us have good days and bad days and days when you wake up in the morning and feel anxious and awful and days that you feel better. Um, so fluctuation from day to day is part of sort of normal human uh, existence. Um, and I think that in people who have any form of illness, that that can be accentuated um, and that sometimes your highs can be very high and your lows can be lower. So I think that the first thing is, to, is, is just to reinforce that, that I think those sorts of fluctuations of having good days and part of bad days are, are, are normal to an extent. Then the question is, uh, is there anything specific about PCA that might give you particularly good and bad days? Um, so first of all, I think that people are likely to be affected um, by things that perhaps more than, that by, uh, more than normal by things that might affect other people. So a poor night's sleep or being pain or being hot or being cold or being uncomfortable. If you have particular difficulty in, in, in expressing yourself, um, or a bit more vulnerable, then that might be um, more of an issue. 
in terms of sort of the underlying biology, in terms of the underlying brain changes, uh, we know that PCA is, is usually caused by Alzheimer's disease. We know that there is an overlap sometimes with other conditions, uh, such as dementia with Lewy bodies, which can be associated uh, with uh, what looks a little bit like Parkinson's disease. Um, and patients can have both Alzheimer's and Lewy body pathology. And we know that one of the features of Lewy body pathology is that there is a bit of fluctuation from day to day. I think in answer to how to deal with this, I think it's going to be looking for external triggers and making sure that those are catered for, particularly around sort of pain, distress and sleep. I think reassurance and the fact that you can have bad days and good days afterwards, it's just reminding people that things often do get better that following day. Um, and of course, people may not remember quite as well as, uh, as, as people without PCA that they have had those sorts of times before and bounce back, because I think many of us will reassure ourselves that if you're in pain now, then that pain will go. And if you've got a down day, then you may have an up day coming. Um, so I hope that sort of gives some, some answers to, to why that might be the case. It's really helpful. Thank you, John. Um, and I should have said, Sandy or Edward, if you want to come in and offer your perspectives on, on any of these questions, please do just give me a wave or unmute and jump in. Um, and it would be great to hear from you as well. Thank you. Um, OK, so a question that is maybe now a bit more for you, you Edward and Sandy. Um, I care for someone with PCA who is very independent and regularly goes for walks. I have some concerns about them getting lost. Is there anything I can put in place to help support them with this? Edward, we know you do your 10,000 steps, so you might have some, some wisdom here. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> my, my trick is, is I use the same route every day. Um, and, um, and that way I don't get lost. <laughs> so um, that's, that's, that's an important one for me. Um, and and, and um, I'm hopefully gonna get out and do that later. So. Is, it, is it okay for me to come in? Yeah, please do. I was going to say from a sort of a carer's point of view, I do try and always ask Edward to take his phone with him and then I've got the mm -hmm. Find My Phone app on my phone. So if anything did ever sort of happen, um, yeah, you've kind of got that security that I would know, yeah, where, where he was. She likes keeping track of me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree. Obviously, phones are a great thing, but you can actually, it sounds awful, but you can get trackers uh, for people through the Alzheimer's Society and other things that, you know, uh, almost even like a pin or a device that will give you a location. So, um, I mean, the great thing is with Neil, there was a degree of familiarity, but I think as I mentioned in my interview, there was one occasion when he just disappeared. Um, and in fact, we had to have like the police out, etc. cetera. And he'd, he'd walked back to his old place of work um, so they found him where he used to work kind of thing, which is probably a good four or five miles away from where we live, you know, to the office kind of thing. Um, so I think in that case, you know, if you can't always imagine that they're just going for the usual walk around the park or what have you. I think obviously it's great with Edward. There's a great degree of um, cognition of the area and everything around in terms of. But I think as things progress, it's worth investigating whether they remember to take a phone with them or whether you can get like a lapel badge kind of thing that sits on their coat that you can then at least uh, GPS track them. Kind of sounds like espionage, but it's definitely worth it for the relief of anxiety. Thanks, Andy. Oh, Claire, yes, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just absolutely agree with what's been said already and just add that you can get GPS watches as well and you can get accessible phones that actually have an inbuilt GPS tracker in them. And you can get something called smart soles, which is GPS trackers that you can put in your shoes as well. So there are lots of options available. But also just to add on the point that Sandy raised there, there is something called the Herbert Protocol, um, which I'm not sure if people have heard about before, but it's put in place by the Met Police. And what it is, is it's information about the person with PCA, about kind of where they would regularly go for their walks and things like that, and a very recent photo of them, so that if somebody does go walking, 
and they lose their navigation and you can't find them in the usual places, that's something you can hand directly to the police to help them kind of find that person more easily if that does happen. So just an extra safety precaution that you can have. That's so helpful. Thank you, Claire. And just reassuring as well that there are so many different options because I think, yeah, different things are, are right for different people. Um, obviously, so, so great, yeah, that there are so many options. And Martina um, in the audience has actually helpfully suggested that she got a small SOS button from a mountain warehouse um, shop that she finds really helpful um, when she goes walking. Um, so that's great. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, our next question is about assessing sight um, for someone in a care home setting. So this person has asked, please can I ask for advice on how to assess my husband's sight? He's in a care home, unable to see or read or see pictures or TV, and he can't explain what he can or cannot see. Um, so any, anyone here, I wondered if you might have anything to, to say about the challenges of, of assessing sight, obviously for people with SCA. Uh, yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, so uh, people like uh, John, uh, Seb, myself and Tim Shakespeare have had some ongoing work with uh, the professional uh, body for optometrists, the College of Optometrists, in uh, improving more reliable assessment for people who have visual problems owing to PCA. So that was work conducted not just with people on the neurology side, so that's John and optometrists, but also ophthalmologists. And in short, Again, there are some standard tests which can be particularly um, susceptible to um, some of not just the visual problems we've discussed, but also problems, say, with spatial awareness, problems with clutter. There's recommendations on adapting some of these assessments, and I can share these resources after the meeting. But in the context of care home visits, my understanding is uh, from the College of Optometrists that you can have optometrists um, conducting an assessment by visiting people um, in residential care settings. So it might be a kind of combination of approaches where perhaps we can share our resources on introducing uh, optometrists who might not be so familiar with PCA necessarily, but again, it depends from one optometrist to the next. Uh, and perhaps uh, whoever uh, conducts that visit could be making use of those resources. Thank you, yeah, that's great. Did anyone else want to, to add anything in there? Or oh, John, yes. Um, I think it's worth saying that I think some of the questions that come up with the chat um, and in relation to the optometrists and, and, and the common things is that there's a frustration often that healthcare professionals or social services and so forth haven't heard of this condition. Um, so, that's partly down to us um, as professionals who do know about this condition and we're doing our best to reach out and try and as Keir says go to the optometrists go to the general practitioners and so forth um, to to inform people I think we also need to be fair to people that this condition is under recognized but even if it was fully recognized it's still relatively rare and therefore, if you are going to see a new GP or an optometrist, don't be shy to give them the num the email address of, of RDS around the PCA. There's, we've got information for professionals as well. A GP might go their entire career without seeing somebody with this condition, and they're dealing with enormous numbers of rare conditions across the whole spectrum of, of medicine, let alone neurology and, and dementia. So we want our healthcare professionals to be educated and we want them to be receptive to new information, but uh, don't be afraid of signposting people to some of these conditions as well. Um, and if you're going to get an, an optometrist to come to a care home, I would contact that optometrist and I would probably send them the information in advance so that they know what they're doing so they don't just turn up and not have a clue. So I think um, we will hopefully continue to, to increase awareness, but you are the experts, you know a lot about this. We're here to support and to provide extra information. So, so don't be shy of, and don't assume that people will know about this and forgive them if they don't. Thank you, John. That's really helpful. And it was really helpful in your interview, actually, Edward, to hear you talking about your relationship with your consultant and how you feel quite empowered, obviously, to, to tell her how you're doing and what you need. Um, yeah. Hey, she's, she's lovely. And we're seeing her later, actually. So, seeing her today. 
Great. Thank you. Oh, Sandy. Yeah, just on the front of that relationship with your consultant, again, <clears throat> I think uh, our consultant, Angus, has almost become a family friend. Um, you know, that genuine care, not only in Neil's well-being, but in all of our well-being. Um, it, it's just amazing. It, it, it is a rapport that goes beyond a, you know, doctor-patient kind of thing. So I absolutely see what, you know, sort of uh, Edward is saying. I know that Neil used to look forward to going to see Angus. It was as if it was a, a social visit for him to go and see a friend. It never felt like a, a doctor or a hospital appointment. And I think that that's really, really powerful in terms of coming to terms with the condition for, you know, Neil, Edward and everybody else and having that confidence of um, the person that they're talking to, which allows them to open up and be more honest and open with them about things. So, yeah. Totally relate to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you both for, for sharing that. And I, it sounds like a part of that as well is just talking to someone who knows about what you're experiencing. And I, I think that's something that we, you know, that's really central part of the mission of RDS really is that we want to put you in touch, not just with professionals, but with other people who you don't have to explain it. You can just say what's happening and someone else will say, yes, me too, or I get it. Mm. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed we can do that face-to-face -face, um, soon again. Okay, um, a question for you here, Claire, if that's okay. Um, so as a full-time carer for my wife who has PCA, can you please advise or suggest how I could access the emergency services should I feel or fall ill and with my wife unable to take any necessary action? I think that's been a particular worry of, of carers um, over the past year, for sure, about if something happens to them. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a really important question to raise. And I think what it does raise is the importance of planning ahead. So if you are caring for someone with PCA, really helpful to register as a carer with your local carer centre. And also um, some carer centres, not all, have something called the Emergency Carers Card Scheme. And what that is, is it's an organisation that holds information about the person with PCA. So things like, uh, who to contact if you're not able to provide them with care, details of kind of medical conditions that they might have, GP information, and also information about what support needs they might have as well. And you keep a card on your person so that if the emergency services need to provide you with care, then they find this card and they can call the number so they know to put that support in place for the person that you're caring for. And even if your local services don't have this in place, you can actually just make your own emergency carers card so you can keep something with you so that if anything does happen to you, it has the number of maybe a friend or a family member that can come and provide support for that person when needed. Um, if you don't have a friend or family member that would be able to provide that support, I think it's really important to have a conversation with social services, with your local authority about putting a support plan in place, just to make sure that if anything does happen to you, that there is going to be support in place for that person that you're caring for. There's other things that you can put in place as well. So some people will probably have heard of the message in the bottle scheme through Lions. And what that is, is very similar to the emergency carers card, but it's a bottle that you keep in the fridge with information about the person that you're caring for. So that if the emergency services are coming into your home, there's a sticker that you put on the back of your door and they know that they can access that medical information in the fridge as well. So that's a helpful thing to put in place. Something else that this point kind of raises, I think the question was about whether the person with PCA isn't able to kind of contact emergency services on this person's behalf. Um, so I think it will depend what stage the person with PCA is. So it may be that if they're able to use an accessible phone, they may be able to contact emergency services. So there's some phones where you can just push one button and you can input numbers. So they just need to push that one button that will go straight to emergency services. 
there's also kind of panic buttons that people can have as well that will go um, to organisations to let them know that emergency support is needed. Um, and if the person is not able to do either of those things, it might be a case of letting neighbours, friends and family know to check in on you every so often just in case you might be needing more support. And if you can't do that either, I would really recommend again, speaking to the local authority, um, and maybe it might be a point of having additional care in the home if that is something that you're really concerned about as well. Thank you, Claire, really thorough and lots of pointers in there, thank you. Um, there have been a few questions in the chat. I think your, your interviews really um, struck a chord for other people with young children, um, Sandy, and. Edward and families and just wondering about any other resources that you have maybe found helpful um, about PCA or any other support that has been helpful for your families. Um, I guess, as I said, you know, I think informing the school is really good because usually they have some form of pastoral care or something um, that, that would be helpful for them. Um, I know, as I mentioned with Alicia, I encouraged her, there are um, counsellors available um, for children, you know, sort of, and I think, you know, you can access them online and you can make a very good match in that way. Um, there was also run by our local council. It was a young carers um, kind of association, but obviously they were probably for younger people, well, for young people dealing with people more with physical care needs rather than understanding PCA. and. I hope it's okay for me to mention, but I think because of the lack of support out there, I know that this is a passion of my daughter, Alicia, and she's she started up um, a support network, of building a community, if you like, online for young carers um, called Seeing Things Differently. Um, so I think it's a place, it's, it's not that professional counselling, but it's a place where people in that position can share their experiences and offer tips and advice. So I think talking to somebody, finding a friend who understands, maybe signing up to seeing things differently, looking for a counsellor if you feel it would be good to talk to somebody independently, um, you know, is, is really important for young children. And I think really letting the school know um, so that you can work in partnership with them, particularly if they're obviously still at school age. I think, you know, um, that the one-on-one -on -one counselling perhaps as they get, get older might be a good suggestion, I think. Sorry, thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Edward or Samantha, did you want to add anything to that or are you? No, not really. All right, thank you. Um, there have been a couple of questions about research, so, so drug trials and clinical um, trials that people could participate in. Um, I wondered, uh, John, if you might have um, anything to say about that. Um, so, so, so very briefly, we'll cover just clinical trials and then PCA uh, specifically. Uh, the first is we need to be completely honest is that there are no new drugs licensed. If so, you would certainly be knowing about them. They'd probably be headlining this uh, session. Um, so we don't have any new medications that are currently licensed for Alzheimer's disease. As many of you will be aware, um, there is at least one study which is currently waiting for a decision by the Foods and Drugs Administration in uh, the United States, which will be a novel disease modifying treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And there are others that are elsewhere in the pipeline. I think just a word of caution and caveat for that is that um, if there were a drug, if one of these drugs were licensed and there's some concerns that this might not be the case, but if it was, it, it, we mustn't expect this would be immediately available in, in, in the UK or to, to individuals. Um, uh, there would be many jump, hoops to jump through, and these are very specialist uh, settings in which these new drugs are given. Um, so um, I want to just, I don't want to take away people's um, optimism, but I think we need to temper this with some realism as well. I think there are major changes and there are major hopes um, out there but i don't think it's likely that there's going to be a new drug that we'll be able to prescribe on the nhs in the next year or so 
That having been said, there are things that are definitely moving forward. With regards to PCA studies um, at the moment, um, we are doing a lot of lobbying, um, and particularly Keir and Seb, um, and, and certainly the piece that, that, that Keir and I authored in, in, in The Lancet Neurology, it is really beginning, to, is making the case that um, whilst lots of clinical trials have been in what is sort of rather known as typical Alzheimer's disease, memory-led Alzheimer's disease, and have often rather precluded people with PCA because they don't sort of fit into those boxes about what most people think Alzheimer's is, that people have not been able to enter studies. And we feel quite the contrary, that in fact, people with PCA would be excellent people to enter into clinical studies because people's memory is good, their understanding is often good, um, they're often very motivated, often people are a bit younger and therefore healthier. Um, and uh, from an equity perspective, that people should be entering clinical trials. So as far as I know, at the moment, there aren't any disease modifying or drug trials that are specifically targeting PCA. We have run small trials from the Dementia Research Centre at UCL in the past. But we very much are, hope that we are changing the views on this and that we will be able to offer clinical trials to people with PCA in due course. And if you don't mind me jumping in on John's point, I think a key thing here as well as appropriate outcome measures. So what we're using to evaluate uh, the efficacy of any intervention. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people here have experienced, well, whether it's under um, clinical context, having to go through quite detailed assessments, in some cases, or in, unfortunately, the majority of cases, a lot of drug trials are set up to evaluate uh, changes on domains, for example, relating to memory. And in some instances, you can have someone with PCA whose memory performance is actually very good across the course of the study. So arguably, you're getting less information in terms of uh, their decline over time. In other instances, you can have some tasks that are intended to evaluate what psychologists might refer to as executive functions and things like multitasking and planning. But actually, there's so many visual components that what it's really reflecting is people's difficulty in complying with a task where you're having to use a lot of hand-eye coordination or recognize a complex figure. So that's another drum that um, myself and John and seven others have been banging uh, for some time. And then there is movement on some of these topics. So in the US, there's a very large study called the LEAD study, which essentially is hoping to build capacity uh, for a lot of interventional research in young onset Alzheimer's disease. So not exclusively PCA, but a proportion of participants will have a diagnosis of PCA. And actually some of the authors on that Lancet neurology work John mentioned uh, are affiliated with the LEAD study. Thank you, Theo, and thank you, John, as well. Um, and yeah, just really encouraging that even though, as, as John was reflecting, um, PCA is rare and not very well known, it's really good to know that, you know, the work that researchers and members as well are doing um, is, is raising awareness and is, is educating. So I hope you'll, you'll continue to feel empowered to do that. Um, I'm just conscious of the time, so I'm, that's all of the questions that, that we'll have for today, but I would just encourage you, if we haven't got to your questions, because there have been a lot of them um, flurrying in, do send them to the Rare Dementia Support and um, Direct Support team. Their, their contact address is contact at rarededementiasupport.org, um, and they will be able to get back to you individually um, on a one-to-one -one basis to, to talk about your questions. And one thing I wanted to mention before I leave um, is just that for any of our members joining from Scotland, um, Alicia and one of our uh, PCA support group members, Alan, are starting a regional um, Scottish PCA support group, um, hopefully with their first meeting next month. So if anyone's interested in that, um, do drop Alicia a line. Her, her email address is a.willoughby at ucl.ac.uk, but she'll be sending an email after this meeting, so you can just reply to that. Um, any of you based in Scotland who would be interested. Um, and a huge thank you to, to all of our panel and um, for all your contributions. And I'll hand over to Seb now um, to close. Thank you so much, Emma. And thank you to the wonderful panel and all of our other speakers today. Um, and most importantly, for you all for being here, for being part of this, uh, for sharing your experiences, your questions. Um, and we just hunger for the days when we can be at this point saying, great, crack out the coffee or the sandwiches and spend some time together as friends um, but thank you in the meantime for um, being part of this virtual meeting we really appreciate it um, 
one thing as always is we we thrive on we are built on your ideas your feedback what you want what would be helpful what's missing from what we currently offer so if you have any reflections on today's meeting things that have worked things that um, you are missing things that we could try again topics you would like us to see cover in future meetings and um, please please do feel free to share that via the um, feedback at the end of this meeting and also a reminder that those sorts of ideas and also of course any any concerns any requests for help can always be um, shared with us uh, at contact at rare dementia support um, and nikki and the team will uh, very very good at being uh, rapidly back to people uh, in fact they put my email very slow email response rate up utterly to shame um, so please do <laughs> know that you will get a speedy and um, heartfelt response from them anytime you're in touch great well without further ado the last thing for me to mention is that uh, what follows this meeting is just a very short video from uh, the our colleagues at the national brain appeal who do a wonderful job um, bringing in funding and supporting all of you who fancy doing a bit of uh, creative fundraising for us to help keep the service rolling and to keep people uh, manning the phones and hopefully trying to always endeavour to provide better and more tailored support. Um, if you have any ideas uh, for, fund for fundraising, um, they would be very happy to talk with you. It can be quite a fun collective thing. Uh, some of us uh, are engaged uh, in uh, some of the sort of standard activities. So Nikki and I, for example, will be trying to lose those. Well, might, certainly in my case, I haven't seen Nikki off the camera, so I won't begin to comment, but certainly in my case, trying to lose those lockdown pounds um, by yeah. Uh, pounding the pavement and uh, running the London Marathon later in October. Gosh, we'll see how that goes. Um, but you may have other creative ideas or know people who, it's not just about money, it's about ideas, ways people can support um, contacts um, of your, in your friends and family who might want to provide ideas about support with advertising or videoing or making international connections or anything that you are passionate about and interested in, please feel free to be in touch with us. But in the meantime, thank you again for being here. Um, we uh, will love you and leave you now and look forward to being in touch in due course. Hello, my name is Eva Tate and I'm the Major Appeals Manager and Manager of the Rare Dementia Support Fund held by the charity, the National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia Support's 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support group. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. This year, we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000, and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research, with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support, as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us. We have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW polo and we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February, we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible, where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of Red Dementia support. And we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion, the charity is committed to raise up to 7 million to create the world's first centre of excellence for Red Dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new capital appeal, um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. 
Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the Senior Fundraising Officer at the National Brain Appeal. Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time. My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you are interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, hosting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out, or even donating money that you may be saving by not travelling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.